<laughs> good afternoon. It's good to see you guys. And welcome to those watching online. We are continuing in our series, talking to kids about things that matter, right? It's about the stuff that matters. And today I've got a treat for you. I am going to team teach with one of my next generation uh, youth directors, right? She's going to come out and have a couple of points with me. So we're going to team teach. And we are going to tackle today uh, what, how to handle harassment and bullying, okay? So this is going to be, it's, it's a touchy subject, but we're going to bring it to you. And we believe that God has a word just for you. So it is my custom to open with prayer. So if you bow your heads, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come even more. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you filled this room, every nook and cranny, Lord, and that you brought each folk in today, Father, and even that you're sending your Holy Spirit over the airways, Father, of this video, <clears throat> that those that are listening, Father, will feel your presence, will sense who you are, Lord. And Father God, I thank you that all distraction is minimal in the name of Jesus Christ and that the truth of the gospel can be heard, Father. I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do today. I look in great anticipation in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, guys, so we are going to talk about bullying and harassing. And if I were to ask you to raise your hand, right, about how many of you can remember if you were bullied or harassed, right, when you were a kid or a, a, you know, a youth or an adult, I would venture to say, because I'm not going to do it, most of you would raise your hands. You see, most of us have encountered being bullied or harassed, right, uh, in the school, schoolyard, or playing ball, or in the campus, at work, right? And even for some of you guys, it's in your home, you know, because bullying is everywhere. And it's not just now done face-to-face, because -face, we have our technology that's at play in our culture, and so you have something called cyberbullying <clears throat> that's going on, right? And so now you can be bullied by text, social media, or even in the gaming world. And what really should alarm us is that a large amount of our young people are in those platforms. And so they're just getting smashed about. And that's the reality, right? So what does God have to say about all this bullying that's going on? <clears throat> you know, does he have to say about this? Well, you know, when I open up the scriptures, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going. When I open up the scriptures and I read, I am uh, aware of the fact that God uh, is showing us that sin, it mars everything, right? It messes up everything, even relationships. It just does. And so we need to know that's part of it, why people are trying to, to harm us or <clears throat> cause us to, you know, to be manipulated or control us and stuff like that through these mediums. Even Jesus talked about it in, uh, in his parables and in his teachings to us, right? And I'm going to bring one to you today when he talks about being... Uh, oppressed or, you know, having opposition come against us. Look what he says here to you and I. He says this in John 13, 33, and this is kind of the foundation of our teaching today. He says, I told you all this, <clears throat> so in that, trusting me, you will be unshakable and at peace. Listen, when we trust him, right, we are unshakable and we're at peace. Those are the byproducts, and if you lose both of those byproducts, that means you're not trusting him, right? All right. In this godless world, you will experience difficulties, but take heart, I've conquered the world. And so we're just to step out in Jesus Christ and the teachings that he has for us. You know, he's, he understands about bullying that's going on, but he wants us to rethink some things, right? You see, bullying happens for a, just a number of reasons, right? It can happen with somebody who doesn't like your appearance, <laughs> right? So they come after you about that, or, or you can be bullied or harassed you know, for your age, for your gender, right, for your race. I mean, you can even be bullied for your faith, you know, believing in Christ. Isn't that been going on now for 2,000 years as Christians? Yes, it has. And if you go, I like to watch <clears throat> the news online and stuff like that, the Christian uh, literature that's put out, and we are seeing an uptake, right, this last uh, decade in Christians being persecuted right? They're being persecuted. There's a 2021 World View Watch, and what they do is they watch the world and the countries, and they've named 150 countries that persecute Christians. And to give you the depth of what I'm talking about, there are 50 of them that they, they state, which represents 245 million people that are being persecuted daily, 
right? They're being sent into uh, these refugee camps or they're being discriminated in the community. They're being in prison and a lot of them are losing their lives. So why am I up here talking about that, right? Why? Because if I were to sit down and ask you, what's the most bullied, harassed group of people in the world, you would probably give me the wrong answer, especially this month where we've got all the rainbow stuff coming out, right? You would give me a different answer. But I want to tell you that the number one group that's harassed like nobody else is Christians. They're Christians, right? And so they are, they are and that might shock you and go, really? Yes, they are. They're the number one persecuted group of people, right? And it's because uh, that, that uh, their faith has caused them not to be able to, or Satan, I think, is oppressed. It's not been able to get out the word. You know, we don't hear it on the social media or the media news, right? You don't hear it because it's the most underreported statistics that's out there, yet it's going on. Now, I'm talking about bullying and harassing, and you might be tempted to say, yeah, Sharon, I felt bullying and I've been harassed, but you know what? They didn't even know that I was a Christian. Well, let me say something. They probably didn't know you're a Christian, the people that are doing that. But let me tell you this. Satan knows, okay? And Satan knows that you are a child of God. And so, see, Satan already realizes he's lost you when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. He lost you. So all that he can do now is make you miserable, right? He's going to try to make you miserable, and he's going to let harassment and bullying and persecution come your way because he wants to get you off track. And he doesn't care about the harassment if it comes because of the color of your skin or your gender, right? He does, he's going to use whatever medium he can because he wants to get you off track. See, this subject matter that we are talking about today is not a tiny one. It's one that each and every one of us experiences. And so this is why I want to bring you five truths that I see in Scripture, right, that's going to tell us how we can handle harassment. And I'm going to bring up Miss uh, Miss Bernicia to do that. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So I want to start with a fun fact. The church turned 27 this weekend, and I'm 27 years old, y'all. <laughs> But even at 27, I still feel bullied. Um, and that is mostly when I turn on the TV and I watch the news or I scroll through social media, especially on social media. It's like the expectations of who I am and what the culture thinks I am, they just conflict, right? Because I am Christian, I am black, and I'm also a woman. And so I I can a lot of times begin to feel battered by the cultural expectations of, of what I should be believing. Now, I do have political views. You know, I'm pro-life, and I believe that black lives matter, and I believe that people need access to health care. But what happens when the Black Lives Matter organization doesn't necessarily line up with my Christian convictions? Or what happens when I'm really aware that the middle class is being affected by the Health Care Act financially at a disproportionate rate than other classes. I feel that I'm needing to choose a side and there's this tug and pull for me to pick a side when Jesus died for all of those sides. Amen. There's a pressure that society has put on me to defend my womanhood, to defend my ethnicity, when all I really want to do is rest in my Christianity. Amen. Because I really thought that I left bullying in high school uh, with that young boy who sat behind me in my third bell calculus class, you know, <laughs> but apparently I didn't. It followed me into my adulthood, and there's this pressure for me to take sides based on what I hear or what I see in the media and am I conservative or liberal and all of these things and the fact of the matter is is these issues are very natural but what God wants us to do is see these things with our spiritual eyes not our natural eyes amen and so we know this because we have to begin to recognize the source behind the bully and remember who we are in Christ the expectations that we live up to as Christians are not given by this world, but by the word of God. Amen. There should be no pressure to take sides that do not line up with our Christian convictions. And the fact is that we don't all think the same. So we are going to have 
opposing opinions at times. But as Pastor Andy talked about last week with friendships, that's okay. We should be able to be around people who have different opinions than ours. And we should be able to cultivate healthy conversations concerning those different perspectives. But in no way, shape, or form should we be bullied into aligning with something that doesn't sit right with our spirit. Because uh, when we make sure that we don't uh, get caught up in what the world is saying, we realize that we are not fighting against human beings, but against wicked and spiritual forces, as Ephesians 6, 12 says. And this is my go-to verse when I'm feeling bullied, because there can be a tug of war on these really distracting issues. And, and we know that the enemy wants us to forget that we have freedom in Christ. Amen. He wants us to be divided. He doesn't want us to, to stay in the grace of the Lord. And so when we go to 1 John 4, verse 4, it says, You, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome the world because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen. The enemy has a plan, and, and like we said, it's to make you forget who you are in Christ. He wants our culture to be divided. And the fact of the matter is, is these issues are pressing, and we should be able to discuss them, and we do need to exercise our rights to vote. But in no way, shape, or form should we feel bullied or bully others into making sure that, oh, you're on my side or I'm on your side, right? Instead... We should refuse to retaliate and respond positively. Now, opposing views can be very uncomfortable, okay? I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I do still get a little defensive, you know, when some, somebody, we're not agreeing very well. But we need to remember that we have to have a Christ-like response. And we shouldn't be bullied and we shouldn't bully others when they have different opinions. Instead, we should really evaluate what they're saying and listen to them. And when we begin to listen, we can respond with grace. Now, First Peter 3, verse 9, it says, Never retaliate when someone treats you wrongly, nor insult those who insult you. But instead, respond by speaking a blessing over them because a blessing is what God promised to give you. Now we all have family, friends, strangers with strong political and cultural views, amen. And especially when they get behind that key keyboard or that little phone on Facebook, they can get real mean and it can feel like you're being bullied because they are. But we have to refuse to retaliate as the scripture says. And when we refuse to retaliate, we give room for the Holy Spirit to move. We can hear people and we can understand what shaped their viewpoints because the fact is, is that hurt people hurt people. <laughs> but that can stop with us, okay? Our cultural views are not shaped their cultural views are not shaped by the loving perspective of God's word that we have, correct? And so they have been bullied, and then they're projecting that hurt and that pain from that bullying on us. And then so then, of course, we get defensive and we want to bully back. But no, that's not the right way. We have to begin to remember that these people and even us have been shamed for our skin color, our gender, our sexuality, socioeconomic status. And so these harsh words that we've all had incoming to us from childhood, you know, we build this barrier and we try to protect ourselves and that's what they're doing. They're protecting themselves from the bullying they have endured as well. And so instead of, of being tough and, and wanting to argue back, the scripture is telling us we need to pray blessings over them because a blessing is what God has promised us. Now, going back to John 16, 33, um, it says again, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. The trouble is bullying. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Christ, he overcame this world and it's bullying. 
and we can overcome bullying and we can help others overcome bullying. The fact is that harassment and bullying can be very painful and society throws things at us and the enemy is trying to divide us. But if Christ promised us peace in him, we can encourage others that that peace is theirs as well. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Thank you, Bernisha. All right. So how do you take something evil like harassment and bullying and make something good so much so that you can be at peace with it? Well, Bernicia just took the first two points to talk to you, but I want to talk to you about another one, to refocus on what God says. So instead of focusing on the pain, or the rejection, the opposition, I'm going to suggest that you focus on what God has to say, what God wants to do in that situation, right? There's a scripture here that's 1 Peter 4, 14. It says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ... That means anytime you stand up for the values and the ideas and the thoughts of Christ, you are blessed because it means that God's spirit is on you. It rests on you. I put this in yellow because this is huge. This is a secret of the kingdom of God, okay? This is what happens. He marks us. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, there's a mark that goes on us, right? And a mark that people can't see but they can feel, right? It's a mark that that the spiritual realm, though, they can see it, right? They can see it. And this is so important. I want to make sure you get it. It means God's spirit is resting on you. And it says in Acts 5, 41, this is how the apostles, the disciples, right, how they've seen this, the disciples were full of joy that God considered them, God put his spirit on them, right, considered them worthy to suffer disgrace for Jesus' name. And so what I want you to see here is that there's a spiritual element that goes on to the harassment, that goes on to the opposition, that goes on uh, that, then the persecution that we are not really aware of all the time. You know, I was thinking about this, and I, I thought about uh, a story I want to tell you about my brother, my oldest brother, right? He and I uh, grew up together, and Debbie, we were three, and that's my sister, we were three inseparables. Uh, we went everywhere together, and my father was in the Air Force, so we moved around the world, so he was my protector, right? Well, around 18, I found Jesus Christ, and he didn't understand that, and I didn't understand his reaction. He began to harass me and to bully me, right? Every time he would see me coming for years, he would say, he would start to mock me by singing, onward, Christian soldier, right? And he would laugh and stuff, and he would tease me. And, you know, I didn't understand that. But here's what I know. You see, him and I, uh, like our family, we grew up in a religion called Catholicism, right? So we grew up and we were active in the church, which meant that I knew that God was the creator. I knew that Jesus Christ was the son of God and had died for the sins of the world. And I knew the rules and the regulations, right, of that, of that uh, religion. Well, let me tell you. When I sat down with somebody who began to explain to me something other than what I had been uh, known, right? I knew it up here. When they started to say to me, Sharon, do you realize that Jesus Christ died for your sins? Every place that you missed it, that's where he died for. And he did this because he loves you. He cares about you, right? And so he was so concerned about you that he went and he paid the penalty for all those mistakes you made. And he gave up his life because that's what was required for you. Oh, my gosh. It went from the head knowledge all of a sudden into the heart. And I found myself in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I had been marked. But, you know, I never became a fully devoted follower until I began to understand that at that time of accepting Christ, that he deposited his Holy Spirit in me. Right? And so when he gives us the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden we become empowered to walk as children of God. And that's what he's after here. Right? And so when I understood all that, I began to be able to interpret the teasing, the, the harassment that I was getting. You see, my brother loved me. He just didn't understand what was going on. Right? It rocked his world that he knew. And I think if we understand... That, that there is a mark on us, that there's a spiritual element to people when they react certain ways to us, it helps us to find grace and forgiveness and mercy for them. Do you see that? Right? You know, another truth that I found when the Spirit of God comes on you, when it comes on me, it's because God trusts us. 
He's grown our character so that he can trust us with many things. And so he allows us to undergo this, uh, this difficulties or this harassment and bullying and even persecution. He allows it to come in because he could stop it all and he doesn't. Because he wants us to be able to know that he can trust us. We see this in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. It says this, these troubles won't last very long. They feel long, <laughs> right? Yet this short time of distress will result in God's uh, richest blessings upon us forever and ever. And so what he's saying to us and challenging us, get your eyes off of the situation and back on to what's happening in eternity, right? Which is where I want to go next with you. I want to talk to you about this next level of being able to deal with harassment is to remember that you are eternal. See, it's easy for us to forget that we are eternal and so we need to continuously remind ourselves, and I need to remind you, that God has created you for eternity, not just for, you know, the 60, 80 years that you're here. And so we need to know that. Now, in the scriptures, when you open them up and you read it, you know, there is a passage that, uh, that Jesus teaches. It's called the Beatitudes, right? Uh, it's the Sermon on the Mount. We get the Beatitudes out of that. So anyway, in there, he talks about harassment and bullying, believe it or not. But he doesn't talk about it and focus on that. He talks about it in light of a promise. Look what he says here. He says, just what Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you, uh, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Look at this. Rejoice, right? Be glad. Such an opposite response, guys. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Because, because great is your reward in heaven. Remember you're eternal, right? It's not just the here and now. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so what the scripture is telling us is that we need to not just have a momentary thought, but we need to know that we were designed for eternity, and it goes in, into eternity with us, and that should give us confidence. And this whole idea of the prophets, that means you and I are in good company when we're getting harassed and bullied, right? That, that you're not by yourself. You're not by yourself. You were like Moses and Abraham and Elijah and all those great prophets because this is what they endured also, right? And so we walk with them. Now, guys, I'm not impervious to, to being, uh, not being harassed. A couple of months ago, at one of my teachings that I was doing, my online campus uh, person that, that runs it, she came and she was talking to me later, and she was telling me that a gentleman had gotten online with us because we have a live stream and uh, you can feed your comments and so forth. Anyway, he took um, ought with me being a female, my gender, and teaching the word. Not what I was saying, just the fact that I was a female and I was a teacher. He felt that was wrong. So he started to put his opinions in there, which was fine because it's a free feed. And so the, uh, the different people, including her, tried to talk to him. But he wanted to use the platform to get his concepts across, right? Uh, and to lock up the, uh, the conversation. And so they ended up having to shut him down. And he went, boat, <laughs> went over to another site that we have a live stream and did the same thing. And they had to shut him down again. Guys, when my staff and when, when my campus pastor or campus leader came to me and was talking to me, they were all very careful about telling me, you've been harassed. <laughs> right? And stuff because they care about me. But you know what? I don't care. I don't care what people do. Why? Because I have an eternal perspective. Amen. You see, I know who I am. I know what God has called me to do. And because I know that deep down in my soul, no matter how much adversity comes at me, I do not back down, right? I stand up and I push forward. Now, that what I'm talking about is how to handle the bullying and the harassing is because inside I know what God has called me to do. I know my purpose people that are that, that you have children or, or your mentors have kids now listen carefully this is important you need to help them you need to help the next generation know that god has a calling on their lives that he put a purpose in their soul and you need to advocate that they figure that out that they find out what is that right i mean i'm so anthetic about this that we get up here and we talk about grow track ad nauseum to you guys. Why? Because it's there that we begin that process of helping you to discover, to help you to discover what the calling and the purpose is in your life. We take you through that process. We begin that journey with you, right? That is what young people need. That is also why I accept all the youth into the grow track as well. 
because I know without it, then they're, then they're just flying in the wind. This is an important thing that we remember that we're eternal, that God has given us a purpose and we must fulfill it. All right? Now, the, uh, the last thing I want to share with you on how to respond to her harassment is being able to remain faithful. Now, if you open up the word and you look at it, faithfulness and being faithful is having faith is believing in things that you don't quite see happening yet, right? Uh, but that you have hope in them. So it's the hope that you have in Christ Jesus to move or to do something differently, correct? Okay, that's what remaining faithful is. You don't quite see it, but you know what you need, and you're hoping God is going to go there with you. Now, I want you to hear this. When I got ready to do this message a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> and I knew I was team teaching uh, with Miss Bernicia Jones, one of our young people, I, I began to pray. I was like, okay, Lord, how do you want me to handle this? And the Lord dropped something in my heart, a name that I hadn't thought about for years. It was this young man. His name is Barry Logston, right? Now, Barry, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Barry. Barry, uh, Barry was like this super smart guy, kind, sweetheart guy, right? And uh, he, I met him at Regent University. He had gone to William and Mary, top of his class in law, right, and or in studying history, and then came here to go to law school. Now he could have went anywhere, uh, you know, into an Ivy League school, but really felt like God said, "Come to Regent University." That is what he did, and that is where I met him, and we dated for a couple of years there. Okay, and uh, upon graduation. Uh, he was he was an excellent lawyer, so he got hired. He got gobbled right up with a big firm that's here in town, uh, and he was an international lawyer. And he made big bucks because that's what they do, right? And uh, all the trappings of wealth and everything started coming his way. But you know, around that time, um, I met Andy Mead, right, and fell in love with him. And so Barry and I kind of parted company there, right? And stuff. And matter of fact, last time I saw Barry face to face was when he came to my wedding. He sat with my mom, right? And as he was there, he reached over, he, he whispered to her, he said, That should be me, not him. <laughs> you know, and we get a laugh, mom and I, when we talk about it, right? He's a very kind hearted, sweet man. Anyway, he went on his way and doing his thing, and we, we kind of parted company. Well, let me tell you, about 10 years or so goes by, right? And I get a call from him out of the blue. And I'm like, wow, this is a, a, you know, a blast from the past, right? And so I, I reconnected with him. I said, so what have you been doing, right? Well, he began to tell me that the firm that he was with, you know, where his career was going up and to the right, that while he was there, they had asked him to do uh, something unethical. They asked him to bill people hours that he hadn't done, right? And he knew that went against his Christian character, and so he prayed about it, he thought about it, and even though they were compressing him, harassing him to do that, he said no. He refused, right? And you know what happened to him? Got fired. He got fired, right? Not only did he just get fired from the firm, they also maligned his name in that community. Well, I'm going to tell you what he's telling me. I'm like, what? I'm like, did you sue him? <laughs> and he goes, no, right? He knew retaliation doesn't work. He's like, no. I just refuse to let somebody bully me, right? I refuse to lose my integrity over this. Huge, right? Now, he was unemployed for a couple of years. He lost everything he was building. He lost, you know, all the, the professional gain that he had made. He lost that. Ended up having to go back and live with his parents, right? I'm like, Barry, how did you do it during that time? I mean, how did you survive? That's like a test of your faith, of your character. What did you do? And he said, tell you the truth, Sharon, I clung to God. I clung to his word, right? And I looked for his promises and what he would say to me during this time. And this is one of the scriptures that he had quoted. It says, Jesus says this, anyone who has given up house or lost brother or sister or father or mother or children or lost property or their career, right? For my name's sake, now watch this. Ready? We'll receive back a hundred times as much in return, right? A hundred times as much in return and will have eternal life. And so I read that. Do you believe it? Because Barry believed it. He believed it. He's like, yes, yes, right? So anyway, when the time came where Barry was in this place of trying to, uh, 
you know, seek the Lord and what did he have for him. And he started to push in. Now, this is a guy that could do anything he wanted to do, right, because super smart. Well, as he was there with the Lord, the Lord began to show him his shape. His shape is his spiritual gift. It's his passion, his heart, his abilities, his personality that he gave him, right, and those experiences in life that he had had. And so he began to understand how God had created him. He began to understand. He sat before the Lord, and, and, he, and he lifted everything he had, and he said, what do you want me to do, Lord? And the Lord said, I want you to leave international law, and I want you to go into domestic law, and I want you to give a voice to those who have no voice, to those kids that are at risk, those youth, and those kids that have been trafficked. I want you to stand up for them, Barry. And so Barry thought about it, and that's indeed what he did. He went up to Newport News. He started his practice up there. He got involved in the judicial system up there. He started all these kinds of programs and stuff for kids, right, and for youth. And I'm going to tell you, his excellent character, his work, was seen up there and they appointed him the judge of that district court and then he got reappointed to a larger district right and so God's hand of favor was upon him you see I chose to talk about Barry today I wanted you to see him I wanted you to meet him this is this is Barry today right I want you to see him because he's an ordinary guy like you and me and yet in the face of harassment he was able to to stand up, right, and bullying, to stand up for Christ. And I want to encourage you because I think that's the challenge I want to give you today is that God is looking for men and for women who will stand up for him, who will be not afraid in the public opinion, but would stand up and voice their opinions of who Christ is. And I think God's looking for that. And I want to challenge you maybe this week, that you could look for ways that you could stand up for Christ, right? Maybe it's just praying in public when you're, when you're got in the restaurant and you're doing a meal. That's small, but it's huge for some of you. Or maybe, or maybe there's some of you that have been coming for a while and you've heard the message of Christ, right? And then, and then you know you haven't really committed yourself to him. Well, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of declaration that you are not ashamed of God. That you love God. That you understand what he did for you. You see, in a few moments, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to accept Christ, right? If you want to walk with him, you want that freshness. And you can raise your hand and you can say, yes, that's me. I'm not ashamed. I want to be counted in, right? And there's some of us that are here and you hear this growth track. We're saying get involved, get involved. And you find yourself, I don't know, you're an introvert and you're like, I can't do it. I got this to do. I got that to do. No. To be brave, stand up, begin to understand the calling God has in your life. And it begins in that room when you start to declare that, yes, today I'm going to change the way I've been operating. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go to this growth track. I'm going to give it. I'm going to figure out what my calling is and my purpose. I'm going to begin that journey, right? And then there's some of us in here, maybe you can consider. Maybe you can consider. And this one's a big one for me. There are so many people that do not know Jesus Christ that are right in your community, your sphere of influence. Perhaps you can pull their name out. Perhaps you can start to pray for them. Perhaps you can text them and let them know that you're praying for them. And then just let them respond. It doesn't matter if it's harassment and bullying. Just let them respond. You see, God is looking for men and women that will stand up and declare who he is like Barry did. And when the harassment comes, know, as he has shown us, Barry, when he got um, harassed and bullied, he knew it wasn't the firm. He knew it was Satan trying to work on him. And then he knew that he, who he was in Christ. So he chose not to retaliate but to pray. And in that compression, he got into his closet and began to beseech the Lord. And the Lord gave him a vision. He gave him a new wind in his sails for the purpose that he had for him. God wants to do that for you guys. He wants to do that for you. Now, when I got ready to share this story about Barry, I wanted to uh, tell him. I hadn't talked to him in a while. I said, I'm going to tell him what's going on, right? Uh, another, uh, you know, a blast from the past here coming. So I got on my email, and I was going to uh, uh, send him a note via where he works at um, as a judge up in Newport News. And so I called up his email, and but what came up was that he had died. 
yep, that he had died. And you know, when I got that news, oh my gosh, inside, it just felt so sad, right? It felt so sad. And then right behind that, the Holy Spirit came in and he spoke to me, and this is what he said. He says, Sharon Berry has one more thing to teach you guys. It's Matthew 10, 32. But for those who declare publicly that they belong to me, which is what he does, which is what he's asking us to do, the Lord, I will do the same for them before my Father in heaven. You say, each and every one of us, there's a day when it ends, and we don't get to choose it. We don't get to choose it. It just happens. It just happens. And so you and I need to be ready. We need to understand that everything that comes into our life is to be yielded to the Lord, right? You want to be able to walk like Barry did before the Lord. The Lord not only knew, hey, here comes Barry, right? But he also knew all the things that he had accomplished. His purpose was done, and that's why he called him home. Guys, you are the same. You're the same. We need to remain faithful when, when the world comes and persecutes us or harasses us and bullies us. Bow your heads with me. I'm going to close in prayer. Thank you, Father. Mm. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are moving. Yes, Father. Father God, first of all, I intercede for these folks that are in here. Mm -hmm. Lord, I love them and I know you love them. And I ask, Lord, that you would go right now. And where people have been wounded and they have been hurt, I ask that you bring in your, pre yeah, your precious healing power and that you would reframe in their hearts, Father, so they can see, they can see the pain and they can see how you can use it and they can give it to you, Lord. And Father God, I ask that you would rise up the people of this congregation, Lord, and those people watching online, that they would be people with backbone, Lord, that they would be people that would stand and declare their love for you and yes, Father, that they would be like that lighthouse that's shining out for everyone that's far and adrift to see, that they might draw all men unto you, Father God. Now, I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for what you're doing amongst us, Lord. I know. And so, Father, there are folks here that, that haven't made that decision, and there are folks watching online. And so I'm going to give you an opportunity to declare today while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, this is between you and the Lord. But I'm going to ask you to declare today your love and your willingness to follow Jesus. And if that's you, you can just raise your hand like this in the audience. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm going to give you some more minutes. You can do that. And people online, this is for you also. There's a button there that says, I raised my hand. You can push that. Okay? All right. Yep. Okay, I'm going to give you another minute. You can put your hand up. Give it a wave so I can see some. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. We'll put them down. Father God, those that declared their desire to follow you, to make you the leader of their life, I'm going to lead them right now, Lord. So those of you that raised your hand and you pushed that button, you just say this right where you're at. Say, today is the day of salvation. Today I declare Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior, the forgiver of my sins. Today, I ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill me up. Today, I follow you. So, Father God, for those that were praying that prayer, those that were brave enough, Father, to raise their hand, those that click that button, you say that you write their name in the book of life. Now, Father, I ask that the uh, Holy Spirit would put wind in their sails and that they would be able to, Father, produce all that you say they are, to produce, Father, the, the things that they can take with them to heaven. Is that not what we all want, Father? And so, Holy Spirit, again, take these words, take these words, Father, that I have sown, and I ask that you'd plant them in the hearts of those that had the soil, those that had the ability to hear what your spirit is saying. Father, we have deposited them. And I ask, Father, that not only 30 or 60, but I ask 100%, Father, that they would have return on that, that that thing, Father, that they understood would begin to blossom and bloom, Father, in their lives. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you for coming and being with us today. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Well, we're getting ready to do some transition time, right? And go back into worship. But before we do that, those of you who raised your hand in the auditorium and those of you who clicked the button, those of you who raised your hand, tell somebody about what you're doing today, about the decision. You can do that on the tab, right, and put it in the clear box when you leave or come forward for prayer. Those that are online, you can instant message us and we'll return your, your comment back, right, and talk to you about next steps. Everybody's next step should be to go into Grow Truck if you haven't done that, okay? All right. Now, for those of you that are uh, understand about tithing and you tithe here, you give here, well, I want to thank you for that. But I also want to pray for you especially today. There are ways now that are coming up that tell you how you can participate with us financially to help uh, support this church. But, you know, when I pray for you, I understand that you are a pillar of this church. You help the gospel be preached to be able to help people. And so you're very vitally uh, loved and supported here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bless you guys. So stand up and all, go ahead and stand up now. We're getting ready to go back into worship, but I'm going to pray a blessing over you. Okay. And the blessing I want to uh, bless you with has to do with your giving. Okay. So those of you who are, you know, who give here, I want you to just kind of put your hand out here because I believe that God's going to give you something in return. So just in front of you, I know it's silly, but just, it's a visual. You just put your hand in front of you. Good. Okay. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come upon each person, Lord God. And Father, I thank you for their faithfulness and their gifts that they bring here. Lord, I know it's an act of worship when they give. And so I thank you, Lord, and I celebrate with them also. And I know your word tells me, your word tells me that, that uh, when you say tithe, you say tithe to the house of the Lord and watch if I don't pour open the floodgates. That's not my words, those are your words, Lord. And so I speak that over the people and I ask, Lord, not just financially that you bless them, bless them in their health, bless them in their families also, Lord. I thank you, Father. I thank you that they are the pillars of the church that we are able for these 27 years to rise up and to take the mission that you've given us to be that contemporary extension of the good news of Jesus Christ to our community because of their faithfulness. And I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.